Joining us now on the War Horse Sportsbook Hotline is the aforementioned Nick Ba. Nick, how are you this morning? I'm good. I, I got an intro. You, know? <laughs> you nice. did. You made it. <laughs> but it wasn't making it on TV. You got your intro. Yeah, that us. whole national now television broadcast it. thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the open. <laughs> That's it. I made it, man. I got an open. That's half the battle of life. So, Robbie, it's all downhill for me now. <laughs> Rob, <laughs> Robbie and I were joking earlier, and it may not be so funny because he was on uh, the news earlier, but when's the last time you've seen a, a tirade or kind of a meltdown or a narrative that Patino is spinning year one at St. John's? Does he does he sound like a guy that wants out? <laughs> I mean. You ever I, heard? Have you heard that before? No, I, I mean, you heard various things. I mean, even, even Scott Frost would like hint at <laughs> the issues with the roster, but I don't know if I've ever seen a coach so blatantly just throw a fastball right down the middle at like exactly <laughs> what he was. You know, there was no like in you know, reading between the lines. Well, who is he talking about? Like he named players. Yeah, it's just I don't know. That's little little surprising to me. Um, but you never know. I don't know. I always wondered. Like, I don't know how you, you guys are. Uh, you know, you've been in locker rooms. All you, both of you have. Like, I was trying to really put myself in like a St. John's player's shoes because, like, we do this thing in the media. We're like, oh, no, I mean, the players are going to really not like that. I'm trying to really put my my go back when I was playing, which is like a long time ago now, and like really think about how Coach Holton says something like that about me, calls me out, like. Uh, Bill Phelps says something like that, calls me out, like how I would have felt about it. I certainly would have been in my feelings for a second, but at the same time, I don't know. I mean, I, I think at the, I, I would have had a hard time, like not at least acknowledging what he's saying and trying to like change it, you know? Yeah. So it's interesting because, and this was minor in comparison to what Patino said, but I remember just last two weeks ago, uh, when Coach McCaffrey was at the the podium and they had a chance to come back, and I think it was Minnesota, and and maybe it's personal because I know Josh Dix, but he was like, you know, when Josh Dix gets a rebound and he he throws it to their guy, and if we just make a simple, you know, inbounds or right. pat, at an outlet pass, like, and I was thinking, gosh, he just, I don't know, he called my guy by name, <laughs> right? So I was kind of, <laughs> I, I, I paused it, but then I thought about it relative to what he was saying, and I was like, well, he kind of moved on. He didn't harp on it. But then I hear yesterday, and I was like, oh, psh, friend, that was nothing. Like, he, <laughs> at least he didn't go patino. Right. I, I think I think the big thing with, with you know, whether we, we, we talk about what Matt Rule says publicly to the, on a Monday press conference, like the most important thing is what is said face-to-face to the player yeah, yeah. from the coach. You know, like that. that is, is it the first time, time they've heard it? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, if that is the first time Josh Gates has been called out about maybe, you know, turning things over on an outlet pass or whatever, or, or you know, just anything of that of that nature, then I think it's going to land different. But I just always, I don't know. I mean, certainly certainly things have changed dramatically in the way quotes circulate and the way press conferences get shared. But I can't ever really remember what Dana Altman or Bill Self said in a press conference. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I certainly always remember what that's they told a good point me or, or, or what they told the team. So I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but there's certainly public messaging and we got a really good one uh, in, in Nebraska and in that rule and what he, what he preaches and talks about. But like, I don't know. I, mean, I think oftentimes you need to understand that like what's being said in that locker room, the coach, the player, that still is the most important stream of communication. We're talking with Nick Ba. He is a, College basketball analyst for Fox Sports One, host the Nick Bob podcast, of course, Chicken Nick podcast as well. Uh, Nick, I'm curious what you thought as you kind of watched that Marquette getting beat down by UConn on Saturday. Is that because my guy over here thinks Marquette's uh, maybe a little bit? <laughs> well, I've been on I've been the on the anti Marquette train for a while. Maybe a little bit of while. an imposter. Right. Do you think that says more about? DB's opinion on Marquette that they're maybe a little inflated or does that kind of tell you more about yeah UConn's really kind of that guy um I, I would say in the moment as I was watching it I, I felt like I was more like man look at UConn mm-hmm. like look at look at these guys look how connected they are but that doesn't necessarily mean that DB is not on the right track like there just has felt like at times there's been a little something missing with with Marquette mm-hmm. uh and I don't with 
the easy thing to point to is like, well, Omax prosper. They don't have him, and that's the difference. Like, I, I don't know if like you plug him in if it changes everything. Uh, I, I just I, I wonder if they're when when you play the emotional no one believes in us card yeah, yeah. all like that is your rallying cry and that's what gets you out of that's what what gets you to lace them up and compete like when that's not there what else do you have to kind of rally around mm. and so sometimes I, sometimes they uh they they seem like they're missing a little something intangibly which sounds bizarre uh I've I've always felt like I, I felt like this with the, the, the Creighton team that went to the Sweet 16, sometimes when you return everybody, you you understand what goes into the process, but you get bored with the process. Mm-hmm. You just want to fast forward to when it really is real in March. Like, you just want to – I think I had an analogy a couple years ago with, like, you, you know, you're playing Mario Brothers or you're playing a video game and you can have, like, a – I think it's Sega. There was, like, a code you could type in that got Sonic all the way to the final level. <laughs> You know, and so you bypassed everything that got to that final level to, to beat the game. And sometimes I wonder if Marquette's a little bit in that mode, where they like they just want to get back to the NCAA tournament, and they, they need to kind of get back invested into the process of it. But at the same time, they had won eight in a row uh, heading into that game. UConn has made a lot of teams look bad at, at in in their home building, including Creighton. So. I, I don't know. I don't necessarily. I'm not ready to sound the alarm on on Marquette, but I think UConn is uh, is is really good, which is a little. I thought they'd be really good, but man, I mean, I, to lose to lose their three best players and be back where they're at. I mean, Dan Hurley does a hell of a job. That team that team plays tough. That team plays with a purpose. That team plays unselfish. Like the, there is a the, there is a a, a clear cut style when you're watching them play that you know Dan Hurley is all over that team. Nick, what? where do you put Creighton's chances of knocking off that team in Omaha tomorrow? Because as you said, I mean, I agree with everything you said about them as far as how scary they look. Obviously, home versus away is, has been a big narrative of the entire college basketball season. But where do you? where is the path to victory for Creighton tomorrow if there is one? Well, I definitely think there is one. First of all, uh, yeah. I really, I, I really think Creighton is. Uh, even though I, I said this to Coach McDermott at, at the Georgetown shoot around, you know, they were what they had been like. They lost a couple. They lost at Providence, and they lost to Butler at home. And I was like, I kind of like how you're playing. He was like, Me too. <laughs> and and, and that, that kind of, that's the thing you got to remember. It's like, yes, you want to win games, but you want to be improving this time of year. Yeah. And I think. Like, if you look at the numbers, I, I was looking at them last night. The first seven Big East games, Creighton averaged 67 points per game. The last eight Big East games, Creighton averages 87 points per game. Mm. Now, there's a couple of overtimes in there that inflate it, but I still think you guys get the point, and if you don't believe me, go check Ken Palm's offensive efficiency. Yeah. Like, Creighton's now a top-20 offense. I just like how they're playing offensively, and – I think a big part of that is Stephen Ashworth has, has really taken a big step forward. He's playing a lot more confident. So the path to victory, Robbie, to me is like you have to be able to handle the physicality from the UConn defense, the pressure. If you if you try to remember what that game looked like a couple of weeks ago at UConn, Creighton just got punked. They were on their heels. They got pressed out. It was hard for them to even enter offense. Mm-hmm. So I think because Creighton's in a better place offensively and they're a little bit better at getting in the open floor at home, I just think they're going to be able to have a little bit more success offensively. And because of how they've been playing, not to mention Baylor Shireman, who was just on a holy crap run here. <laughs> like, this guy is playing incredible. So, I mean, the path to victory is, is handling the ball, handling the, the, the pressure. I feel like Creighton's in a better spot. So I think they got a really good opportunity to give a UConn all they want tomorrow night. Yeah, I want to stay with Baylor here real quick, just because we got into it last week and the week before. You know, we were just talking about the triple-double in his game. And I and I just said this with Frankie Fiddler watching his body, right? He's He's got muscles and kind of some striations in his arms where you can see. Baylor Shireman's body looks – 100 percent better Mm -hmm. than it did a year ago and even though he's older he actually looks a lot more explosive and sudden like how much of a credit should we be giving creighton's 
strength and conditioning program, which quietly is pretty good. Mm-hmm. We've seen a lot of the soft tissue stuff go away over the last couple of years. Yeah. Baylor's body looks fantastic. Looks awesome, doesn't it? And, it? and it makes a huge difference. I've always said, like, changing your body is a window into how much all how all in you are. Because some of that stuff takes place outside of when you're in the facility. It's it's turning down pizza at night. It's it's making good decisions eating. It's it's all the it's getting your rest. Like all the things. It's easy to be all in in the time where you're at practice or you're in the weight room. But oftentimes you really want to change your body. It's a 24/7, 365 thing. And so to me. One of the first things that popped after I didn't see Baylor Shireman for a couple of months in the offseason, when I saw him at practice, I was like, damn, he looks great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you look at how he's played, I mean, he's had, has he had three or four, like, I'm talking in traffic. Dunks, yeah. Hammer dunks mm-hmm. on people that I don't, I, he, I don't think he was doing that a year ago. Well, the one and the so, other night, he used his right hand, too. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, left handed dude, right hand, in, like, that is, that is, is impressive, and I think a part of what has helped his game is I think he's, he, he certainly can make that little tough spin fall away 15-footer, but he's done a better job of getting all the way to the rim to finish, and I think you can attribute a lot of that to his body. And, and I, I also think there's something, too, whether it's real or not, when you're in the weight room and you're busting it, and all of a sudden – you start to see gains. All of a sudden, you, yeah. your max bench goes up 10, 15 pounds, and you're feeling stronger. All that does is fill your confidence cup. Mm-hmm. And basketball is a confidence sport. So whether or not Baylor Simon, I don't know, doing curls and tricep dips and stuff, how much that impacts his ability to come up a ball screen and make a read, who knows? But I know that he feels like when he looks in the mirror, he sees a, he sees a badass. And that makes a difference. So I, I think he is... I, I released a pod this morning. I think the case that I think it's time to start having a real conversation about Baylor Shireman as the biggest player of the year. I think he is, it's him, it's Carter, it's Colick, and it's Newton. To me, it's those, those four guys. And at this point, I would give the nod to Shireman slightly ahead of Devin Carter. I think where things shake out in the standings will, will make a difference. But I've just been so impressed. You know, Shireman, what number number three in scoring, number two in rebounds, leads the Big East in double-doubles. He's 10th in assists. He's second in minutes. I mean, the guy the guy has been a warrior this year. I think relative, uh, this is a good debate because I kind of wanted to go national. Mm-hmm. Or we're, we are going to go national anyway. But I tried to make the case last week that Newton should be, not maybe not, and I'm glad you mentioned Tristan, be, he could, I think he could make the case for player of the year. When I look at yeah. – and I love the guys you mentioned. No, no disrespect, right, especially with level of importance to their team. But given UConn's versatility and the number of moving parts they have, he's still the guy that makes yeah. them – he's still the guy that makes them go. He is – he's something else. Well, I mean, David, think about it. Like, every situation is different. Like, it, the, the situation Devin Carter's in at Providence, is not even close to the same situation Tristan Newton is in at UConn. Good, good point. Like, Carter has to do everything. He's the you know, easy, that, fun guy, like, where it's like, oh, yeah, that's obvious. But, like, I oh, totally, I'm with you. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I think in some ways, and and I even, you know, I, I can call myself out in this as I'm making the case for or against everybody. Like, Tristan Newton is somewhat of a victim of how balanced and good his mm. team is. Yeah. When you watch UConn play, there's no doubt that, that Newton is the dude that makes it all go. But when you watch UConn, you're like, wow, this team is just, it's five as one, the, the more of the totality of it all than it is when you're watching Providence and you're like, look at this dude, Devin Carter. <laughs> this guy's getting every rebound. This guy's making every play. You know what I mean? Like, so it's just it's different situations. So compare it to, I'm sure it's maybe a little analogous. I don't know if you have anybody off the top of your head, David, that like, okay, yeah, anybody can get, you know, a buck 92 on the ground when they're getting 27 carries in there. You, you, you know who, you know who, he, the, on a local level, you, he's Anthony Rizak. We have a lot of good players. Yeah, there you go. A lot yeah. of good players. But, but Anthony is the guy that kind of, he's, it, it's got to start there. <laughs> Yeah, for, right, for all right, that everybody right, else right. is doing, yeah. it, it's right. it's Anthony. To- totally agree, but now I'm with you. You, Chris uh, Newton's a stud. Uh, yeah, I mean he's he's he is he deserves every every accolade that that, that he gets. If he if he was four dudes got named Player of the Year, I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh my god, this is ridiculous. Like, mm-hmm. like you can make it like like Colex numbers, they're all up. Every one of them, like all like point 
Bloomberg's name pop. Three Bloomberg's name is pop. He sounds pop. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, everything's up, up, up. And yet we're like, ah, we saw him do it last year, so it's not as exciting as it was. And Aren't he you? actually had a little bit of a lull a couple of weeks ago, and it was like, yep. oh, maybe the league's catching up to him. Nah, right. that wasn't it. I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, that, dude, that, dude, that dude is a hot cold dude. He's a, a tough player. Let, let me ask you about uh, Nebraska, because Coach Weyberg said something the other day, and and – he was talking about in in the press game press conference, and he's he's actually one of those guys who has been a little bit more open, I think, to to critiquing his team. You know, he hasn't mm-hmm. he, he, like he'll he'll say some names, you know. And yep. the other day, he you know he was talking about Casey's shot selection. He says, you know, even when we, when Casey has some of those bad shots, and you know when he's going, that's kind of what makes him him. When he's not, it's like we got to find other options. And we've seen him sit some key guys in some spots. How much do you think, Coach Hoiberg, and how he he realizes he's got options to play a couple of different ways has freed him up to coach these guys pretty hard? That's a great point, Damon. I mean, it, it really is because that that nothing nothing motivates quite like that bench. You know, like, <laughs> like, like, you know I mean, when you think back to like the, the Branch McGowan, the Lonzo Bird team, like those guys could do whatever they wanted, good or bad, any spot they wanted, don't rotate for them. Like and it didn't matter. They they were they were coming out like or they were staying in the game. Like this year, that's not the case. And I mean, you saw it against Wisconsin. Like Casey Tomanaga didn't have it going. Well, guess what? CJ Wilcher is gonna gonna come in and, and play the rest of the game. Yeah. And the bench just the the different ways they can play. I mean, look at the starting lineup right now. They go Bryce Williams six 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 seven, and they do have Tomanaga, but then it's Gary all of six 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 seven. Rick Mass six ten. Josiah Allen, 6'10". So they can play big, but then they go small. They, they threw lineups of, of Sam Boyberg, T.J. Wilcher, K.C. Tomanaga. They threw Bryce Williams out there and Rink Mass. And all of a sudden, you got like a smaller lineup out there. So you have options, uh, which I think is, is really, really helped this team in a lot of different ways, not only tangibly with changing the complexion of, of games with guys off the bench, but intangibly to what you're kind of hinting at of, Listen, you're, if you're not going to do the little things, you are going to sit. And I think that is something that as much as anything else has changed over the course of the last couple of years at Nebraska basketball is they are starting to, to invest in and believe in, the, in the, the details of the game. And the only way those details really kind of get enforced is that if you don't do them, there's a price to pay. Yeah. And th- there, is, there, is right, there is one right now. There's no doubt about it. Nick, I, I have kind of a strange question for you here um, from the national perspective. So, so bear with me. But who is the worst team that's currently that you think can win a national title? Like, because you obviously have you like your your UConn, Purdue's, Auburn. But is there, <laughs> yeah, is there a team that's like, man, I don't necessarily love how they play, or maybe they're not having the season I thought they would. But man, I could kind of see that team making a run. Man, that's a that's a that's a hard question. You, you know what's weird is a part of me wants to say Kansas because of their bench, just because of how thin they are. Yeah, like their bench, they really have like they, they got four great players, but they're they just they do have flaws. Mm. Uh, you know, I just don't. When you watch Kansas play, they they. You, you don't necessarily get the feeling like you felt in years past in watching a Bill Self team play where they're just like they check all the boxes that you that you could want. Mm-hmm. They, just as you were as you were asking that question, Robbie, my first thought was was KU just because of like they they do have glaring flaws. They're not a good three point shooting team. They're not deep. They really struggle to handle the ball outside of of DeJuan Harris. Uh, you know, Hunter Dickinson is limited defensively. Uh, you know, they, they used to be able to have this. Now, they, they've shown it in spurts, but, you know, the team that won the title, the Ochai Abaji, Christian Brown, Jalen Wilson team, like, they had a level they could go to defensively where they just could, like, turn it up and, like, foil you, and it was it was done. And I don't know if this team has that in, 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 its, in its arsenal uh, frequently, but a part of me wants to say Kansas just because of how flawed they are. But at the same time, their four best players are, are big time. As but good as anybody, they, yeah. Yeah, you know, for me, it, does it seem like Duke is twenty and five? And I, listen, I'm yeah. an ACC honk, right? So I, I watch them a ton, but it's like, 
How it's not how is Duke good, but I'm kind of like, how are they twenty and five? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I and I know, and maybe I'm just like I catch them on games where they don't really have their A game, but I'm totally with you. Like I watched them play at Carolina, and I'm just left like, really? Like, you know, that that you know like that's all, that that that's it. Like I I don't I don't I don't. I don't feel like you can – because there are times a team can play bad, but you still see it, yeah. you know. Uh, I just don't know. I'm, I'm with you on, on Duke. I think the team that if, – if I had to flip it, a team that is like – that every time I watch them play, I, I feel like, damn, I kind of like that team. And yet they're not necessarily always in people's projected Final Fours because they certainly have a lot of other things going on for them, is Illinois. Like, Illinois is a team, I, me, whenever I, I watch them play, I like them. I would make the case for Shannon. I mean, and, and Robbie, he, he made me hit default because I don't think – I get it. Edie will probably be player of the year. I don't think he should be. <laughs> but um, Terrence Shannon, like, he's on a heater. And when yeah. they get going, man, Illinois is – and I get it. Michigan State's his guy. But, like – that's a good basketball. They have a lot of good pieces. I think Domask is awesome. Hey, and like, he's crafty awesome. too, isn't he? Yes, yes, he is. And in Coleman Hawkins, when it's mm-hmm. right, that guy is is can a, stretch a you unicorn. He can stretch you. He can he can bring it up the floor. He can pass. Uh, Ty Rogers is maybe the toughest dude in college basketball right now. Like, can't shoot a lick, but it's like you can't <laughs> take him off the floor. You know, uh, it, Luke Goody can shoot it. Like, I just I, – I, they're a team, depending on their path, that I would I would take a good hard look at, at, at taking them potentially to Phoenix. Depend, I just – I like how they're I, – I, I like the makeup of their team, but I just don't – and the reason I brought that up, and maybe it's all matters on, you know, what you're consuming or who you're talking about. I just don't hear a lot of people talk about Illinois being a Final Four team, and maybe that is because of some of the stuff that happened with Shannon and – and people kind of wrote them off. Sure, I, I think I think it's coached like in our sphere. I think it's coaching. Okay, that I, that could be. You know, I, that that certainly could be. But yeah, I like that team a lot. I really do. That's Nick Ba. He Fantastic. is an analyst for FS1. He's also got the Nick Ba podcast. He's got the Chicken and Nick podcast. He also <laughs> runs Shoot 360 down in Lincoln. You might be I love the promos busy. coming out of the break when you had the Nebraska call and they were like yeah, doing. How about that? Oh, I <laughs> wanted to say something, but I knew you were working. Yeah, I was like, I caught that. that. Well done. Yeah, pretty cool. Nick, Thank we you, appreciate bro. it as always, man. Thanks, guys. Great to talk. That's Nick Ba. Hopefully, we will catch up with him again soon. Coming up next, the Warhorse Sportsbook Sports Cleanup here on Herd Sports Radio.